Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Pivkowski. Um, just uh, before we start, I'm aware or have been made aware that there is a mobile phone that has been found. If anybody's missing a mobile phone, apparently it is being held uh, just at reception over here, uh, just for the purposes. Uh, welcome to this afternoon. Really, really interesting and very important topic in this whole area of uh, surrogacy and parental orders and international surrogacy. Um, this afternoon, we have. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Paul Bowers from Bowers Associates. Uh, Paul has 26 years experience in family law. Um, he has a very strong understanding in this area of this whole legal uh, parentage and birth certificates, which I know is a minefield, uh, particularly for those um, intending on you know, parenting either in Australia or for that matter internationally. So a uh, very important area. I sort of encourage uh, strong participation, any questions that you might have afterwards. And uh, I'd like to welcome along Paul Bowers. Thanks, Paul. Thank you for that. <coughs> um, firstly, I'd like to express my gratitude to the conference organisers for bringing the conference dates forward by a week for my benefit. I really appreciate that. And um, that now means that I won't miss the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> now, before I start my presentation, it's about a case called Green, Wilson and Bishop that I ran in the Melbourne Family Court. And you can get a copy of that um, paper that I've written about it from Sam's desk. Um, I want to read to you a letter to the editor that my bloke Tony brought to my attention about a week or so ago. It says, pay respects to war widows. During the centenary, my thoughts were with the war widows and all the women left behind. These women had to become the head of the household, and what a great job they did. A generation of Aussies was raised in totally female homes. The few men who were around were mainly old men and teenagers. There was no stigma to say you didn't have a father. It was the norm in the years following the war to end all wars. When the argument is raised that a father and mother is the best way to raise children, it belittles the millions of women who raise the families of the war dead. Now, can somebody explain to me why there was a fuss a couple of years ago when two women appeared on play school going about their business raising their child? I think we've got a long way to go. Now, I'm here to talk to you about Green, Wilson and Bishop. Stop working. Thank you. Now, as we all know, surrogacy has been around forever. <laughs> That's nothing new. It's my first slide. Next. Come on. Can you do that for me? Thank you. <coughs> now, the numbers of people entering into surrogacy arrangements is obviously increasing from year to year, as the graph um, indicates. Now, my involvement in surrogacy really arises out of my participation as, as a volunteer, initially in the, at the um, Inner City Legal Centre in Sydney, um, which had a gay and lesbian advice service. I was a volunteer there for 13 years. And I've observed over the past 10 years that we're getting more and more gay male couples entering into surrogacy arrangements as a means of starting a family. So I developed a bit of a special interest in the area, if you like, and that special interest has carried over into my private practice. And I've also played an instrumental role in establishing an LGBTIQ advice service in the Fitzroy Legal Service at Melbourne, where we can also provide advice in relation to surrogacy and, and other matters. Now, I guess for intended parents, um, whenever I give them advice about um, surrogacy arrangements, th the main issue that, that comes up um, to Australians, next one, sorry, sorry, leave it at that, that's fine, sorry about that. Um, the advice that I deal with is one of parentage, are you a legal parent? Um, and the significance of that is um, the exercise of parental responsibility. Now, parental responsibility is all the uh, authorities and powers that you have to make decisions on behalf of your children. Um, and the persons who have parental responsibility under the Family Law Act are the parents of the child, or otherwise, if a court order allocates parental responsibility. So um, the question is for intended parents, who are the legal parents in your arrangements? So 
um, I'm telling them that um, under the Family Law Act, Section 60, Capital H, um, the surrogate mother and um, her spouse, if she's married, um, or de facto, uh, if they're in a de facto relationship at the time of conception, they are deemed the parents of the child. So that leaves the uh, intended parents in a bit of a legal vacuum. So what do you do about it? Now, I'll, I'll deal with um, the, the, the various approaches in uh, the states and territories um, of Australia. Now, um, first of all, it's, it's illegal for any um, resident of Australia to enter into a commercial surrogacy arrangement within Australia. Now, under legislation in Queensland, the ACT and New South Wales, as we all know, it's an offence to enter into an overseas commercial surrogacy arrangement. Um, not that that stopped anybody and, and not that the um, prosecutions have really amounted to anything. Um, as for the other residents of Australia, Australian states and territories, it is not illegal for you to enter into overseas commercial surrogacy arrangement. Now, uh, next slide please. Now, um, in, um, in, as I said, in overseas arrangements, um, the the persons who will be deemed the parents of the, of the surrogate mother and her partner. So what do the uh, intended parents um, do about that in terms of, of parentage? Now, previously, um, the primary the parentage orders, previously the only thing that was available was a parenting order conferring parental responsibility upon the intended parents. Now, that didn't make them legal parents. Now, um, being named on a birth certificate didn't make them legal parents either. Now, a lot of intended parents, they might go overseas to, um, say for instance, um, before we had issues with India, um, opposite, opposite sex couples, um, they would come back with a birth certificate naming them as parents of the child. Or alternatively, if it's a same sex couple, one of them would be named on the birth certificate. Now, um, question is, is that sufficient to make you a legal parent? And the answer to that is no, it isn't. Because uh, under the Family Law Act, Section 69, Capital R, that talks about who are the legal parents when a person's named on a birth certificate. And it says that if you're named on a birth certificate from a state or territory of Australia or a prescribed overseas jurisdiction, then you are a parent. Now, we do not have any prescribed overseas jurisdictions for the purposes of recognising parentage arising out of being named on a birth certificate. So it doesn't matter if your birth certificate comes from India, USA, Afghanistan, wherever. Uh, if you're named on it, you're not a legal parent. So, um, what do you do about it? Um, some people are taking the view that being named on a birth certificate is good enough for me, um, and who's going to know otherwise? Um, and that's fair enough. Um, but um, the correct answer to that question is, um, if, you're not, if, if you're named on a birth certificate and that doesn't make you a legal parent, um, just consider what might be the situation if uh, for instance, you die intestate. Now, you've done nothing about the parentage issue, you're named on a birth certificate as a parent, you die intestate, well, you're not a parent, and uh, your child doesn't inherit your estate. Um, in relation to workers' comp, if you have a, uh, an accident and um, death occurs, um, if, you're, if you don't do anything about the parentage issue, um, then your children don't get the compensation because you're not a parent. What if the intended parents um, separated? You haven't done anything about parentage. Somebody wants to apply to the family court for a parenting order dealing with the parenting arrangements. Well, you're going to have to join the surrogate because she's a parent and it's a requirement when you're applying for parenting orders. Um, the parties are required to include the parents of the child. So that's going to be a legal nightmare, isn't it? Um, now, next one, just practice guidelines. Now, come 2012, we have the case of Ellison. That's a decision of the Sydney Family Court which sets out best practice principles when applying to the Family Court for your parenting orders. Now, um, that's all really fascinating and I better be careful about what I say here. Um, <coughs> personally, and we can roll through to the next one because it goes on and on and on. I don't know how providing evidence of all of those things is going to necessarily um, enable a judge to make a decision about whether to make orders, which in any event is a fait accompli. Uh, now, for instance, um, obtaining evidence of the legal regime in the country where the surrogate resides, what's that got to do with anything? 
you know, um, when we're looking at the case study um, of um, Steve and Toby, this is actually talking about my case of Green Bishop and um, Wilson. Now, uh, in that case, I didn't follow all the best practice guidelines that um, Ellison recommended because a um, well, number of reasons which will become apparent as I talk. Now, the facts of this case were Steve and Toby were New South Wales residents. They, like many other clients that I have spoken to, who were fearful of being prosecuted for entering into a naughty overseas commercial surrogacy arrangement, decided to move to Melbourne. That sucks. Now, um, they came to me, they, they, they entered into uh, a surrogacy arrangement with a surrogate in um, India. Um, they had an anonymous egg donor from Ukraine. They had a written agreement with the surrogate um, and her husband. Um, there was a successful embryo transfer. Um, but they saw me a couple of months prior to the birth of the child. Now, um, at that time, um, I said to them, well, you know, you, you guys aren't going to be uh, deemed the parents of the child. It's the surrogate and her husband. Um, we need to obtain um, a statement from the surrogate mother and her husband as to various things to satisfy the requirements in the case of Ellison. So what I did is a couple of months out from the birth, uh, I sent a letter to the um, agent in India. They were very helpful. Um, you're not necessarily going to get this kind of assistance in every kind of arrangement that you're dealing with. But they obtained from the surrogate mother a statement and from her husband about various things as to their circumstances prior to the agreement during uh, the pregnancy and what it's going to be after the birth of the child. Um, now, I was able to draft the affidavit material in advance, had it translated into Hindi. Um, the agency um, then arranged for the documents um, to be made available at the time of the birth of the child. Now, with the, um, um, the IPs, I emailed to them a draft order um, dealing with you both having parental responsibility, child live with you, name and date of birth of the child blank, you fill it in um, after the birth of the child, get the thing translated, have the surrogate sign the affidavit and English and Hindi version, plus the orders shortly after the birth of the child because if she disappears back into humanity you might not find her again and that might be a bit of a problem. Anyway they did all of that. In between filing, uh, they then came back to Melbourne, I filed an application in the family court seeking um, the orders for um, equal shared parental responsibility and live with and whatever. Anyway we, we filed that application and served it. In the meantime um, as has been my practice in relation to overseas commercial surrogacy arrangements. I had a Skype telephone conversation with an agent by the name of Poonam Jain. Poonam, are you there? Yeah. Would you like to wave? Thank you. Now, Poonam and I had a Skype telephone conference and she was telling me about how she'd been to the Melbourne uh, surrogacy conference last year and a bunch of people came up to her talking about step-parent adoption. And my impression was, well, they must have got it wrong. They must have misunderstood what it was that they were applying to the court for. Um, but it then gave me the idea, the inspiration, um, you know, that they, that to have a step-parent adoption, you have to have a parent to begin with. So that gave me the idea, well, why don't we seek a declaration of parentage? So I spoke to Steve and Toby and I said to them, um, look, what I'm going to try to do is get a declaration of parentage for Steve. Um, and you can do that under Section 69BA of the Family Law Act. And I can make submissions to the court that this will open the way up for a step-parent adoption because we have somebody who's a parent, except that we can't get a step-parent adoption in your case because you're a gay couple from Victoria, and in Victoria we don't have same-sex adoption as yet. Although the Andrews government is promising that we're going to have some kind of inquiry dealing with it, um, you know, there's the usual lunatic fringe elements out there who are you know, anti-gay and will have their two cents worth in the whole debate and um, just really annoy everybody. So. Um, I then, um, in preparation for the hearing of the matter, I drafted a minute of order providing that these blokes, sorry, that um, Steve have a declaration of parentage pursuant to section 69 VA, um, parental responsibility and live with. Uh, I did some written submissions, emailed it through to um, the judge's associate. Now, I should go back a step. Um, before we had the matter listed for hearing, um, there was a mention before Justice Cronin in Melbourne, and you know I said to Justice Cronin, you know I suppose um, 
applying the guidelines in Ellison, you'll want an independent children's lawyer, you'll want a family report, to which you reply, well, why would I want to do that? Um, a family report's not going to tell me anything that the IP's evidence has, has already, uh, hasn't already addressed, and I don't need an independent children's lawyer, it's all been done. So that was fair enough. So he, he just went ahead and listed it for hearing. So it seems that the process in Melbourne, uh, as compared to Sydney, for instance, doesn't require all the bells and whistles <laughs> and you know, all this other nonsense. So it, uh, Melbourne judges seem to be taking a more pragmatic um, approach. Now, so we, we came for hearing. Now, um, I should mention at, at this stage um, the kind of costs that you're going to be looking at uh, for going through this process. And what I've been telling um, IPs uh, is to budget for, say, 10 to 15 grand if you're going to be doing um, the application to the family court for uh, your parenting orders. Um, but I'm basing that estimate, and I should qualify this a number of ways, I'm basing that estimate upon my experience in the case of Green, Wilson and Bishop um, being with India, in, in which case we had to do additional work and additional time, getting things translated and, and all that other stuff. If you're dealing with a country, for instance, like Canada, excluding Quebec and the USA, your costs might be less than that because you're not having to translate documents. A um, number of other reasons why um, that price range I am giving an estimate. Um, firstly, uh, I only charge for work that I actually do. Um, I don't charge for research because I've done all the research. I've written papers about this and presented about it so many times that I know the stuff back to forward, uh, back to front. Um, I'm my own boss, so you know I don't need to um, achieve a certain quota of chargeable work per day, um, which is unattainable. Unattainable, I mean, if you do it honestly uh, and without over-servicing. Um, in relation to the step-parent adoption, I'm saying estimate between six and nine grand. Um, qualify that, say if you've got a married couple, um, opposite sex couple I should say, not necessarily married, um, where both have provided the DNA for the child, it's probably going to be cheaper than that because they can both apply for the declaration of parentage and not need to go through the step-parent adoption. Now, my recommendations were up to require to, um, to, yep, thank you. The orders that you'd be seeking, it's that, and I should say that this is only available in, um, it's not available in New South Wales, the ACT and Queensland. Um, reason given is that um, the judge found that the laws in relation to um, surrogacy in New South Wales, Queensland and the ACT effectively covered the field. They dealt with each in her view, and I don't necessarily know that it's right, but I don't really care. I'll, I'll, I'm, you know, I'm happy to run with it. Um, she gave us the result we wanted. Um, but in her view, um, legislation in Queensland, New South Wales and the ACT um, covers the field in that the criminality of entering into overseas commercial surrogacy arrangements um, she thought that that dealt with the issue of parentage in relation to overseas arrangements. Now, under Victorian legislation um, and elsewhere in Australia, the situation is different because they don't deal with the criminality. Her, the judge's view was because there is no provision in the legislation of all the other states and territories of Australia to deal with the issue of parentage of a child not born in Australia, um, then it's open to the court to make a declaration of parentage, and that's what she did. Now, the orders that you'd be seeking, um, and they read as follows, that pursuant to section 69VA of the Family Law Act, it is declared that Steve, or whoever, is a parent, namely the father of the child, um, or if you're dealing with, say, your opposite sex couple who have both provided the DNA for the child, um, you'd name both of them as a parent, and that's all the order would say. Second order, that leave be granted pursuant to section 60G of the Family Law Act for step-parent adoption, except in Victoria at the moment, because it's not available to same-sex couples. Um, but you understand, otherwise in Australia, um, if it was an opposite-sex couple in Victoria, then it would be available to them. That the parents have equal shared parental responsibility and that the child live with them. So you get those orders made in, in the family court. Now, um, 
Okay, I've got five minutes. Um, <coughs> who should seek parentage if heterosexual and both provide the gametes? Well, I'm saying both intended parents for reasons which I think um, I have discussed. Um, I've done the legal rationale behind the process. We'll skip that. Um, will the judgment be the same in another state? We'll skip that. Now, my recommendations to the um, courts about how to deal with the commercial arrangements, I haven't dealt with that much haven't dealt with that in my paper. Last Friday I wrote, dictated a letter to the Chief Federal Circuit Court judge making a recommendation that all commercial surrogacy matters um, which come through the Melbourne registry of that court go before a particular judge um, who um, I actually used to work with in private practice. She has a significant interest in commercial surrogacy. Uh, she has written about the topic. She uh, was an academic and I think she's the ideal person to have these matters go before. Now, it doesn't matter if your matter is from Queensland, New South Wales, whatever. And also, for those people who have been naughty and have entered into illegal overseas arrangements, where you're from Queensland, New South Wales, or the ACT, I can't guarantee it, but uh, I wouldn't imagine that this particular judge would refer you for prosecution because you know, I think she takes a pragmatic approach. But what I'm asking the court to do is have all the matters go before her, we get some consistency in the way um, the matters are dealt with. There's inconsistency between family court judges about how they're dealing with the matter. Um, I think they're a bit lost, to be quite honest. Um, but otherwise, uh, if we get it before this particular judge, um, I think that you're going to have a much smoother um, process involved in getting your, your parentage orders, parenting orders, rather. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, could I invite, we've probably got about two minutes. Would there be any immediate questions for Paul? Please. Yep. Um, so, I think you cited a couple of examples of people As you suggest, yep. in a practical sense, if that was if that legal problem arose and you it was tested in any way, mm -hmm. a child armed with that um, birth certificate, would it actually ever be a problem in a practical sense? Um, a lot of IPs are, are taking the view. Well, as I said, the the um, the birth certificate's good enough for me, and you get those who whose experience. Uh, in society. I could probably best answer that by giving you an analogy, a matter that I dealt with in Sydney a couple of years ago, and it didn't involve a surrogacy case. It involved a gay couple, uh, one of whom was married. They went through a traditional Maori adoption. Um, the, the Maori guy, his um, niece had had two children, and she said to him, um, look, are you, would you, have you thought about starting a family? Would you like to have my third child? And so she conceived and uh, gave birth to the third child child went into to, uh, his care and his partner's care. They then moved to Sydney. Um, child was seven years old and you know they, they didn't have any birth certificate naming them as parents. They didn't have anything um, connecting them in any way as being parents of this child. But their experience was that they were able to enrol that child in a school in Campbelltown. Um, the view of the school was, well, we don't care. That, um, you know, all we care about is the child is loved. The only reason why they came to me was because um, they needed to get a passport for the child, um, rather a visa, uh, because um, the other guy, his mother in the UK was um, dying and needed palliative care and it was his turn and they needed to go to the UK. So uh, I think in a roundabout that way that, that does answer your question that some people do function without the parenting order, um, but those legal issues concerning workers' comp, um, you know, dying intestate, uh, family court proceedings are very much alive. Thank you. Yep. Um, I wasn't quite clear about your example of the cost structure. You talked about um, uh, a c um, couple that um, a heterosexual couple where both parties were on the birth certificate, yep. um, but I wasn't sure if one of them wasn't hadn't. So, if uh, if there was a donated egg, and one of the parents, the male, had supplied the sperm, does that mean that the wife has to get a step um, option? 
Well, you've got um, one of them who provides the DNA for the child. Yeah. You've got the application of the Family Court for Declaration of Parentage and then leave for step-parent adoption, except that except if they're from New South Wales, Queensland or the ACT, in a situation where they both provide the DNA, um, you don't need the step-parent adoption, you just apply for the declaration of parentage. Okay, even though they mo may both be still on the, the birth certificate, yeah. you still need to, okay, yeah. right, thanks. Time for one more question. Um, if a, uh, a, cup, a couple have um, entered into a surrogacy agreement in New South Wales, mm -hmm. and then after the child's born, they move to Victoria, Yep. Um, can they then apply for the declaration of parentage in Victoria? Have that Do you issue think that that covers that covering the field <laughs> issue um, still precludes them? I can't answer that question definitively because it hasn't been um, done before. Um, although I um, had um, clients recently with that fa very fact scenario come to me, and I've said to them. Look, I can't guarantee that I'm going to get you the um, declaration of parentage and so forth, but apply for it anyway, because if you don't get that, you're going to get the next best thing, which is, you know, your, your parental responsibility order. So, you know, just go for broke, in other words. Pick one. Um, again, I don't know. We don't. No one's tried it before, as far as I know. I'm happy to try. <laughs> could, I, could I just say, uh, if there's any more questions for Paul, um, there'll be opportunities, obviously, after with drinks. Uh, we need to move on to the next session now. But um, I'm not going to be at the, um, here for the next session, so if anybody wants to talk to me outside, happy to talk now. But thanks very much, Paul. Thank uh, fantastic.